The accountant says, well, welcome to my country. And we go, well, your country won't let us in the country. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, give me your paperwork. I said, who are you? He said, my name is TJ Kaunda. Name didn't ring a bell. He said, my father's the president of Zambia, the dictator. That was his youngest son. We gave him our paperwork. He takes it to his father, Dr. K.K. Kaunda, the very mm-hmm. first president of the Republic of Zambia. Mm-hmm. Calls down to immigration. We don't have 10 names on there. We've got one, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, president of the Republic of Zambia. Two weeks later, we're given 300 acres with 30 buildings on the site for free. Over the next two years, a man in the States out of the blue shipped over 12 40-foot containers with supplies to come and hired a builder to come over and restore that mission station that we built and built our houses, the mission. You see, I didn't do all that. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Now, as you know, if you've listened to this show for any length of time, you know how much we enjoy talking about missions on this show. And so we've talked about missions theory. We've talked about the call on your life. We've talked about uh, the history of missions and, and people that have gone before us. But one of the things we love to do is talking to missionaries firsthand. And today we have Bobby Bonner, associate pastor at First Bible Baptist Church in Blue Springs, Missouri. He is a former missionary to Zambia, Africa. Uh, Now, he recently wrote a biography sharing his story uh, about how God brought him through childhood into Major League Baseball, in fact, and then eventually to the mission field and all the different trials and difficulties that he went through uh, getting to that place and and getting into God's will. And so it's a fascinating read and a a wonderful read, and I'm so excited about him sharing his story with you today. I know it's going to inspire you and and, and challenge your faith. And so with that, I want to introduce Pastor Bobby Bonner. Hey, well, it's welcome, man. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. Yeah, we love we love having new folks. This is your first time on the show, and uh, first time us getting to share you and the new book, which was recently published through Living Faith Books. In yes, fact, yes, I really appreciate that. You guys yeah. were a blessing. Well, we enjoyed doing it. We've got a good team, and uh, the book was really easy to engage with, and and it's different than a lot of the other books that we published because it is a biography. It's a it's a yeah. first hand account. Uh, of your life, and uh, it was a really great addition to the lineup. Well, people tell me, Bobby, if you can't preach, just tell a story. So that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a wonderful story, and it goes so many different directions. and And you are really a really great storyteller. And so I'm excited about today's episode because it'll it'll keep everybody's attention. I'm sure. So let's start just by. Uh, discussing what you're doing in ministry nowadays, and then we'll go back to the beginning. I, I want to hear. I want you to share with our listeners what it is that you do at the church and what your responsibilities are and and what your life looks like nowadays. Well, I am the associate pastor at First Bible Baptist Church. I came out here, I've known uh, Pastor Mark Brown for over 40 years. Uh, Mark and I played ball together way back in the early 80s with oh, the Baltimore wow. Orioles. Okay. I remember when he was lost. Wow. I remember when he would come to our Bible studies in our hotel room and stuff. And then his wife, who he married, Cheryl, the former Cheryl Swartz, she was a young girl that used to babysit our children. And wow. so seeing them both come to Christ, and Mark and I have always been sort of accountability partners. And so when I had to come off the field 10 years ago, 11 years ago, because of my health, Mark became the lead pastor at First mm-hmm. Bible Baptist mm-hmm. Church and asked me to pray about coming out, being a part of his team, and being an associate. And mm. so I asked him, I said, what does that mean? What do I have to do? What is my job description? Yeah. You know? And he said, well, I didn't ask you to be the assistant because assistants have to work. He said, just associate. So that's what I do. But it seems like I've been there long enough where Mark gives me some uh, more stuff to do. For example, I teach at our Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. I disciple those that have led to the Lord and uh, take mission trips. I'm also the uh, founder of International African Missions. Uh, Mm. We still are involved in our you know, mission in Africa, trying to reach sub-Saharan Africa with the gospel. Mm. And uh, so um, just do a lot of things, fill in, teach Sunday school, um, your basic, uh, basic, uh, how do you say, uh, dishwasher and bottle washer. Man, there's a place for everybody in God's army. Hallelujah. Yeah. So 
let's start way back. Let's go. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, the same way your your book does is with your childhood, and uh, you had a really un- unique childhood growing up in Texas. Explain to us what the dynamic was, and and how you got into sports, and what your child all what your childhood was like. Well, I I grew up with two older brothers okay. and an older sister, but especially my older brothers, they were thirteen and fourteen years older than I was. Mm-hmm. So. You know, by the time they got out of high school, I was a young punk. You know, I'm a young, I was a young boy, you know, yeah. six, seven. And uh, they were tremendous athletes. Matter of fact, both of my older brothers are in the Texas Football High School Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. And so they were very good ball players. So I would beg them to come out and play with me. Mm. And of course, they're 18, 19. I'm, you know, six, seven, eight, whatever. And uh, they would uh, throw the football and hit me in the back of the head, you know, hit me in the nose when I turned around. My nose would bleed. I would cry. And uh, in that, I wanted to go run to mom, you know, but right. my brother said, well, we're not going to play with you anymore then. Mm. They would always say the expression or the phrase, rub some dirt on it. Mm-hmm. and get back out there. Mm-hmm. And so I'd have tears in my eyes and a bloody nose, and I'd keep playing until they got tired. Yeah. And uh, so I grew up there, and uh, I wanted to be like my brothers. I wanted to be a, a great ball player, so to speak, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, we lived sort of in a small town, West Texas. And and so we moved to Corpus Christi when I was 11 years old. Corpus Christi, sparkling city by the sea, uh, large population, uh, here's a redneck kid coming from the ranch, and everybody's got surfboards. Mm. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to fit in. I wanted friends. Right. And so uh, I put my uh, cowboy boots away and my hat away and started carrying a surfboard. And and uh, But I started playing ball. And yeah. I played football, basketball, ran track, played baseball, played all sports. But by the time I got out of high school, I had four uh, major knee operations. And so I quit playing football to concentrate on baseball. Yeah. And so that was a blessing. So growing up with older brothers, uh, man, it really prepared you in terms of, of toughness and just getting through knee surgeries and not quitting and finding your space, just always pushing forward and pushing forward and finding a way and trying to find an identity. And, and it created some grit in well, your life. I mean, Well, it did. I remember my last surgery. I'd just come out of the anesthesia. And the doctor, Dr. Luke Kay, he operated on me all four times, uh, talking with my mother. And here I am uh, in the hospital, 17 years old, and and uh, my, uh, I hear my doctor say, you have to make your son stop playing sports. He will be a cripple in a couple years if he keeps going this way. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of wept, you know, and cried. And But I, I, I just really wanted to prove him wrong. Yeah. And so I played my senior year and uh, I was drafted actually by the Montreal Expos as a pitcher. I had a very strong arm, but I didn't want to pitch. I wanted to play every day to prove everybody wrong. You know, a pitcher mm-hmm. plays once every four days, you right, know. And right. So uh, Texas A&M offered me a full ride to play shortstop. And so I went to Texas A&M for four years and played shortstop every game. Which shortstop's not easy on your knees. That's no, a tough position. No, it's not. And uh, so I, there were several times where after the games, I would be in a bucket of ice, mm-hmm. and uh, you learn to play through pain. Man. Um, I've been uh, knocked out, I don't know how many times, maybe a half a dozen times on the ball field. Uh, you know, if, if a Little League dad or a Little League mom, the little kid gets hit by a ball and they say, oh, that didn't hurt – well, they've never been here. <laughs> it does hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You're growing up. You're in Corpus Christi. You mentioned in your story about how you were introduced to, you know, some kind of some roughnecks that, that got you involved with drugs, which, you know, at that time period in the U.S., marijuana use was common, drinking, young people were experimenting with drugs, and you found yourself in that world. Tell us a little bit about how you got introduced to all that and how it changed your life. Well, I got introduced to drugs when I was in ninth grade. That was after my freshman year of football, mm-hmm. and I tore my knee up. And so I was depressed, couldn't play, you know, and uh, went to a drive-in movie one night, you know, dollar carload back in those days. Mm-hmm. And uh, three of my best friends, they were kind of snuck out. And I said, where are you guys going? They go, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. And I said, yeah, I want to know. <laughs> they go, well, we're going to go do a doobie. You know, we're going to smoke a uh-huh. joint, marijuana joint. So I said, well, I want to do it, you know. Yeah. And I said yes just because I wanted a friend. Mm. You know, I, I just, I just, I, the peer pressure. I just yeah. wanted a, a buddy. 
And uh, so that's what happened. And in those early, late 60s, early 70s, <laughs> there was a lot of pot going around. Right. You know, I mean, I think 21 guys on our high school baseball team, you know, 20 of the 21 smoked pot. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a common, regular thing around our school. And so, of course, when I went to college, the drinking started and uh, uh, it was it was pretty bad for a few years. And, you you know, you mentioned that that the drug use and the alcohol actually uh, was this kind of pivotal part for having relationships. So kind of all of your close relationships were built around using and drinking. Every one of them. Yeah. Uh, I know we had some players, especially in college, that, that were very, you know, straight, narrow, and that type of thing. And I yeah. sort of admired them, mm -hmm. but I just couldn't pull away from what I was doing and being a part of with my buds. And so uh, friends became very, very important to me. And so... Um, Peer pressure is very strong. It is. I can't even imagine today with the kids, you know, and and uh, I, I was weak. I wanted a friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we all, I think, wanted friendship in those days. And so we experimented with a lot of things. Yeah. And it's really a miracle I got through with it, all the drugs I put in my body, the LSD I did. Now, I never played ball high. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, but after the game, of course, it was party time, you know, yeah. that's the way it was. Yeah. After my first year of pro ball, I was drafted in 78 by mm -hmm. the Baltimore Orioles in the third round. So I went off to play what they call, you know, minor leagues. Mm -hmm. And so I was sent to double A, you know, in, in Major League Baseball, they used to have a, a large farm system where they would have a rookie ball league. They'd have an A ball league, a double A, and a triple A, and then what we call the show, the major league. Mm -hmm. And so I had played Division I college uh, baseball, so that was the equivalent to probably double A ball. Mm -hmm. So I was sent straight to double A ball. Well, while I was there, uh, I injured myself. I injured my back. And, of course, I'm not saved. Uh, I, oh, It almost ruined my career. The only way I could sleep at night was to just get hammered. So I could pass out because the pain was so much. When I'd take the long bus rides, I'd have to stand the whole time. I was just in so much pain. Man. So it ruined my almost my whole first year. So I came home. I was uh, a drunk most of the time. I uh, started working in the oil field. Uh, terrible, terrible, just attitude. My career's over. I had a terrible year. You know, I just want to, you know, hang out with my buddies and get high all the time. And, of mm -hmm. course, I had a wife. I had two kids. Yeah, yeah. So you, you had gotten married in the midst of all this. I got married right out of high school. Mm -hmm. I stepped, uh, as a matter of fact, that first year of college ball, my, my girlfriend was still in high school mm -hmm. in Corpus Christi. I'm playing in College Station, Texas, which is about 200 miles away. So every Friday, I would skip school, drive to Corpus Christi, spend the weekend with my girlfriend, her sister, at her place, and drive back Monday, miss all my classes on Monday. So I'm failing my classes on Friday and Monday. I'm failing. Mm -hmm. I get called into my coach's office and he, he in November, and he says, uh, they used to call me RB, Robert Bonds, mm -hmm. RB, what's what's going on? And I, I said, Well, I, I'm in love, coach, you know, and I'm, you know, he said, Well, do you want to marry her? And I said, Well, yeah, that'd be nice. He said, Well, uh, do you want me to call her dad? And I said, Would you do that? And he said, Yes. Yeah. So my college coach. Tom Chandler called Alfred B. Petty and asked for Becky's hand in marriage for me. So I drove down to Corpus Christi the next oh week. Gosh. He said yes. We got married, brought her back. So for four years at wow. A&M, we were, we were there. Wow, that's that's amazing. It, it is amazing. I can't believe it. I, I asked Alfred after I got saved, I said, how could you say yes to my daughter? Well, see, Alfred was a very strong Christian man. Mm. And it, you say, well, he shouldn't have ever allowed you. He said, I know, but he knew that his daughter was a Christian. Mm -hmm. But his daughter had backslidden and dated me Yeah, and was in love with me. So my father-in-law, my future father-in-law, started praying for me that God would save my soul. Mm. So when I got home in 78, I, I was, like I said, that was the lowest point of my life. I threw my car keys at, at my wife and said, take those babies. I want a divorce. And mm -hmm. I literally shoved her out of the house, locked the door. She got in the car, drove 200 miles to her dad. Her dad uh, hugged her, gave her some money, and said, go back to your husband. And she went back to me, and three weeks later, I was on my knees calling on Jesus to save my soul. Wow. There's a subplot there, I think, that we're missing that's really important, too, and that you've been, you had been exposed to religious people uh, before. You had a 
conviction that there was a God. You just didn't know him. But then uh, was it your second child? Was it Chrissy, right? That there was all the trauma in childbirth. And so there was all this upheaval in your life. And all you knew was, well, rub some dirt on it. And it wasn't working. It wasn't working. The dirt <laughs> wasn't working. Right. So and explain all that stuff that's well, involved Well, what happened in was my wife was second with, uh, pregnant, pregnant, excuse me, with our second child, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. She was due in the 1st of October. So at the end of the season in August, ball season, you know, my first year of pro ball or minor league, um, I was hurt. I was injured. I got a phone call that my wife had gone into labor two months early. Mm -hmm. So I flew home. Well, my wife ought to be up here taking this interview now, but uh, <laughs> she believed that God was chastising her, as it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, that the Lord will chastise those he loves. Because my, mm -hmm. my wife had given her life to the Lord when she was 14. And like I said, she had walked away because of peer pressure mm -hmm. and married me. Mm -hmm. So she never really mentioned Jesus to me. And yeah. so, but I wasn't a fool. I believed there was a God. Never went to church as a young boy, unless it was a funeral or wedding. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't a fool. I believed there was a God. I believed there was a heaven. I believed there was a hell. But I thought I was going to hell because I didn't think anybody could love me. Mm. I didn't think anybody could, you know, I mean, I heard a little bit of the story of Jesus, you know, the Christmas story and things like this growing up. But it was seeing it demonstrated in the life of my wife, mm -hmm. especially if I, after I threw her out, because it was a miracle Chrissy made it. She lived. Now she's married and has three kids and marrying yeah. her kids off now. And so it was a miracle for that. My wife rededicated her life to the Lord. So for three weeks when she came back home, I would wake up at night and I'd feel these hands on me. And my wife was on the floor on her knees praying that God would save my soul. So all week, she's begging me to come to this church. It was a little revival, tent meeting type of revival in Bryan, Texas. And it was the last day of the revival. Old-timey preacher was up there preaching on hell. And, right. you know, and I'm back in the back row. You know, I went with her that morning. And uh, I heard the message. And I go, yeah, there's a hell. Yeah, that's where I'm going. I, I knew. I knew. I, I knew I was a sinner. And then he turned the message into what Jesus Christ did on the cross, mm. how he died for sinners. He didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners to repentance. Mm. And he said, if you'll come, he'll, you can be born again and have your sin. Well, I had so much guilt. I had so much shame. I had so much hurt in my life. And I went forward and I fell on my knees, brother. And I must have been on my knees an hour and a half just weeping and crying. But when I got up, there was peace. Wow. That I never felt in my life. There was the guilt was gone, and I knew Jesus had changed my life. So on the way home, we're singing <laughs> praises to Jesus, little hymns, you know, little verses that my wife knew, and and when I'm trying to sing with her, and and then she told me about the dream, and I so I said, well, I got to go back to work because I'd got a job in the oil field. So I was working with O'Connor and Young Drilling Company out of Houston, Texas. We were a Wildcat crew looking for oil. Mm -hmm. So I went early that next morning, Monday morning, and we're moving the rig to a different location. We're doing what they call spudding in. We're, we're drilling down, and we're running this 18-inch casing down the hole, you know, if you've mm -hmm. got to get a picture. And so after it went down so many feet, we do what we call jet the cellar. We're pumping all the stuff yeah. out of the hole. Right. And so my driller, I'm up on a 25-foot floor, and my driller calls me over and he says, see that valve down there? Well, there's about 30 valves, and pipes everywhere, you know. And I said, yeah, I see the valve. And he goes, shut that valve when I cut the engine off. And so I went down and I shut the, shut the valve. And all of a sudden this whole, I don't know how many tons, steel, derrick, floor, everything began to shake like this. And my driller looks over and he goes, open that valve. He screamed at me and I'm hitting it and hitting it. And he's running downstairs and I'm hitting it. About the fourth or fifth time I hit it, it opened. And I, all I, shh, everything went back to normal. Well, my driller wasn't a Christian and I just got saved. So right. my driller starts cussing me out, calling mm -hmm. me every name in the book. Yeah. But the last thing he said to me, he said, do you realize you shut the wrong valve? And there was about 50,000 pounds of pressure on this whole thing. He said, it's a miracle this rig didn't blow us all to hell. Mm. I wonder what would have happened if I wouldn't have got saved the day before. Wow. And yeah. so I looked at him and I said, praise Jesus. He goes, what? 
<laughs> I go, I got saved yesterday. I trusted Christ as my Savior. You know, if it would have blown up, I'd be in heaven today. What about you? And he goes, oh, you crazy. And he went back and forth. <laughs> but from that time, I just had a, I wanted to tell everyone oh, yeah. that I knew about yeah. Jesus and what he did for me. So you got back into baseball. I did. You healed up. You got back into baseball, which is probably better than oil rigging, I would bet. A little bit yes. more fun. It was a little bit. <laughs> so you get out there and you're playing you're playing ball again. Tell us about what that was like now as a believer, working through, you know, what it was before you got a stark contrast on your hands. What was life like back in in Well, in, in nineteen seventy nine I went to spring training okay. and instead of carrying and, you know, whatever around, I'm carrying a little pocket New Testament Gideon in my mm. back pocket. So I'm reading my Bible every day. Again, I, I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know what a Baptist was, Methodist was, Lutheran was, Catholic was. I, I would spend, if I had any time, I would go to a different church just to see what they said. Yeah. And so I'd read my Bible. I was seeking truth. I just wanted to know the God that saved me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know him, who he is. So I had a New Testament. So I noticed the other guys kind of quit kind of hanging around me, you know, and mm. and then they started kind of asking me to go out with them to party. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't do that anymore. I'm sorry. So I was a little bit ostracized. Mm -hmm. So then as I began to witness to some of the players, all of a sudden we get in a little bit of trouble. Uh, in 79, the farm director of the minor leagues comes into town and calls me privately and says, you have to take the Bible out of your locker. You can't bring your Bible in the locker room anymore. And I said, why? He said, well, you're making everybody nervous. This is for baseball. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, if you'll take all these beer signs down and all this pornography down from this from this room, I'll take my Bible out. How's that? Otherwise, my Bible stays. I said, I got to have a little light. Mm. And so he didn't understand that. And so all of a sudden now I'm having a fight with management. Mm. So now the higher I go up, I'm witnessing to my managers. I'm witnessing to my coaches. Um, Earl Weaver, mm. you know, when I got called up to the big leagues in 1980, he wasn't a real believer in Christianity. So he told me as long as he was the manager in the big leagues, I would never play again. He would never play me again. So they moved Ripken to shortstop that year because I was the shortstop before Cal Ripken oh, Jr. Wow. was. So they put Rip at short in 82, and he ended up rookie of the year that year. Oh, my goodness. You know what? Let him have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what was really neat? A few years later when Rip got inducted to the Hall of Fame, yeah. uh, I happened to be home from Africa. Mm -hmm. So Rip called me because we were pretty good friends. And Rip called me and said, hey, come to the ceremony. I'm bringing in the entire 1983 team. I was on that team that won the World yeah. Series. Mm -hmm. And so I flew up to meet him. And so we're talking, having a good time with the guys. And Earl Weaver walks in. So I went up to Earl and I threw my hand out and I said, Skip, how you doing? He goes, Bobby, you want to talk to me? I said, why wouldn't I talk to you? He said, well, Jim Palmer calls me at least once a month and reminds me how I ruined your career. He said, I'm very sorry. And I said, Skip, my career never was in your hands. Let me tell you what God's been doing in Africa for the last mm, few years. Yeah. I began to tell him about that. And then I said, look, Skip, if you think I need to forgive you, I forgive you and I love you. But what's more important is Jesus loves you and wants to save your soul. Mm -hmm. And Earl started crying. Oh, my. Now, I don't know if he got saved or not. You know, a couple of years later, I think he died of a heart attack. But uh, anyway. Wow. Uh, Anyway, but there was healing there. You know yeah, what I mean? Because I both sides. Because the last time I spoke to him, he was very, very, very angry with me. But what was happening was is that you were you refer to it as getting traded, right? It's a spiritual analogy. You're moving from the the realm of the material and temporal and baseball and you know uh, giving your life to your your dream, and you were trading it for a dream that never belonged to you. It's Christ's dream for your life. Right. Right. And it's really, it's really powerful. And so, man, explain to us from the, you eventually leave baseball. You can tell us about that, but, but how did you get in a place where you were plugged in, getting discipled, getting invested in, and getting an eye, an eye on the mission field? Oh, I got goosebumps when you said that. Because the first <laughs> thing that came to my mind was Hebrews 11. Mm. That was my walk. You know, it says there, verse six, for without faith, it's yeah. impossible to please God. Romans 10 says that faith cometh by hearing, mm -hmm. hearing by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I had my pocket New Testament. I read my Bible. I read it, read it, read it, read it. So I'm going to church, to church, to church, looking for a church that told me truth. Yeah. Jesus said in John 17, 17, He says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word yeah. is truth. So I, I wanted to—what Jesus did for me, I wanted to know Him. Mm-hmm. 
And so Hebrews 11 gives us the pathway to being where God wants us. Mm -hmm. It starts out with the Word of God. We know that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So it starts out with the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then the Bible brings up the first man of Hebrews 11, Abel. Mm -hmm. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. What is that? That's worship. See, worship is more than a song. Mm -hmm. First time the word worship appears, appears in Genesis 22. And the first time the word love appears in Genesis 22, same context, yeah. where Abraham yeah. has taken Isaac, his only son whom he loves, to what? Offer a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And in verse 5, it says, I'm going yonder to worship. Yeah, Worship is giving what you love. So you know what I had to do? 1983, after we won the World Series, I mean, I'm gonna, in one year, I'll be a free agent. So I made a vow to the Lord. Second vow I've ever made in my life. First one was to my wife when we got married out of high school. And uh, we're coming up on close to 50 years, I guess, pretty close. But uh, anyway, we're getting close. And wow. uh, But the second vow was, Lord, let me play and get rid of my contract. I don't, I don't want to owe Major League Baseball anything. I don't want to owe the Orioles anything. I want to mm -hmm. walk away a free agent, yeah. like you said. Mm -hmm. But I have one year left on my contract. So I got out on my knees in 1983 at Christmas time and said, Lord, if you'll let me play one more year, I'll give every game to your glory, whether I sit the bench or whether I don't. It doesn't matter. I'll do everything for you. I'll be a spokesman for you. But at the end of that year, I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to go to Africa as a missionary. And that's what I made a vow to the Lord. Now, I had no clue I'd be in Africa. I mean, the reason why I said that, my brother died three mm -hmm. years before who told me after he had gotten saved he was going to Africa as a missionary, but he died prematurely mm. before he could get there. So that my vow, because I love my brother so much, I said, I'll even go where he said he would go. Wow. That was my vow. Wow, so interesting. And, and so in 1984, I had the best year I ever had. I had five major league clubs call me, offer me big league contracts. I was 28, and I walked away. And then I went to our Bible Institute and our church, was trained. A missionary came in 1986 and started talking about Africa. I went, wow, what do I do now? Yeah. You know, Africa, well, you know, God's reminded me. And all he said in that still small voice was, did you mean it? Mm -hmm. Did you mean what you said? And I said, yes, Lord, I meant it. And he said, well, then go. I said, where do you go? I don't know a missionary in Africa. The only guy I ever heard of was David Livingston. So <laughs> I looked up, where did David Livingston die? Well, he mm -hmm. died in what is now Zambia. So I said, I'm going to go to Zambia. And you say, well, why did you go? Because of Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 3, which say this, If there arise a prophet or dreamer of dreams, mm -hmm. and he giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder come to pass, wherever he spake unto thee, let us go after and serve other gods, which thou hast not known. Verse 3 says this, Thou shalt not hearken under the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with mm -hmm. all your soul. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear a lot of voices, don't we? Oh, yeah. And they're good voices. Hey, continue to play baseball. Hey, you can be a spokesman for the Lord. Hey, look what you can do. Maybe God send you to this town or this club or this club. And I'm thinking, yeah. no, God has bought me with a price. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to Africa to a place, I mean, a burden doesn't constitute a call. Mm -hmm. Paul had a burden for Israel, but God didn't right. call him to Israel. Right. Yeah. I didn't get a burden for Africa until I got there and I sat where they sat and I ate what they ate and I buried their children mm -hmm. and I married their children and I trained their men. Mm -hmm. That's when God gave me a burden. Yeah, yeah. So it, you're already entering into this realm and we want to hear about the work itself. So God got you on the field. What did it look like? Um, what did you? What were you used to establish? What was the fruit? And then what was the hardship? Like we want to hear the difficulty alongside the the beauty and yeah. the, the wonder. I think the most difficult thing of being in a different culture is culture itself. You know, in Zambia there was seventy two different dialects. So mm -hmm. which dialect are you going to learn? So. Yeah. I'm thankful that English is the national language. Mm -hmm. So God brought us men that spoke four, five, six different languages and also English to be trained to take that to their villages. Yeah, It's training faithful men to teach others also. Mm -hmm. But um, that's all about, you know, like he, go back to Hebrews 11. The Word 
the worship, Abel. And then it says Enoch walked with God. Mm -hmm. Enoch was the next one. Well, walking with God means you're being obedient. Yeah. So right there in your local church, I showed up, you know, the day I played a doubleheader in 1984, my last game, the next day I was in a Christian school teaching class that morning, mm -hmm. going to Bible school at night and just looking for opportunity to serve God wherever he wanted me. I didn't care where it was. I just wanted to walk with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next guy is Noah. Noah prepared an ark. He never built a boat before. He wasn't a zookeeper. Yeah. God brought all that to him because of what? Because of the word, because of the worship, because of the walk. Yeah. Then he gave him a work to do. Yeah. See, there's a difference between a work of God and a work for God. Mm -hmm. I want to be involved in what God's doing. When we got to Zambia, the doors were closed. We were the first independent Baptists to come in that country. Wow. The Southern Baptists were there. The Australian Baptists, different people were there. But we were the very, very first independent Baptists. Mm. When we got there, the doors were closed. We had a 30, we had a 90-day visa, three-month visa, tourist visa. So we're going to immigration. How do, you, how do we get a work paper? Well, you got to know 10 Zambians, you know, invite you in the country. And we go, well, what is your name? We don't know 10 <laughs> Zambians. Right. Well, who called you here? Well, God. Well, God hadn't told us. And so they said, look, even if you knew 10 Zambians, we're not going to give any new registrations. So here's a list of 100 NGOs that you can go and ask if you can come under their umbrella in the country. So we spent the next month traveling around to NGOs. No, 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 no. Now, we've already put our stuff in a container. It's coming to Zambia. It yeah. lands in Dar es Salaam while we're in Zambia as a tourist trying to get work papers. They call us and say, your container's ready. Come pick it up. So I got to hire a truck from Zambia to go pick up a container in Tanzania to bring it into a country that won't let us work. Where'd you put it? Uh, well, we, well, here's what happened. We look in the yellow pages. We go down. We take a cab down to the trucking company we pick out. We go back to talk to the accountant. The accountant says, well, welcome to my country. And we go, well, your country won't let us in the country. Mm -hmm. He goes, ah, what do you mean? He goes, give me your paperwork. I said, who are you? He said, my name is TJ Kaunda. Name didn't ring a bell. He said, my father's the president of Zambia, the dictator. That was his youngest son, who was, was the accountant. Was working at Was working at the trucking company. Wow. That we picked out to win. We gave him our paperwork. He takes it to his father, Dr. K.K. Kaunda, the very mm -hmm. first president of the Republic yeah. of Zambia. Mm -hmm. Calls down to immigration. We don't have 10 names on there. We've got one, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, Republic, president of the Republic of Zambia. Two weeks later, we're given 300 acres with 30 buildings on the site for free. Over the next two years, a man in the States, out of the blue, shipped over 12 40-foot containers with supplies to come and hired a builder to come over and restore that mission station that we built and built our houses at the mission. You see, I didn't do all that. Right. But yeah. if you're in the Word yeah, and you're worshiping Him in spirit and truth and you're walking with Him— He's going to give you something to do, and he's going to supply the resources needed. So Abraham is the next guy. He said he journeyed to a place he didn't know where he was going because mm -hmm. he was looking for a city that has foundations whose builder yeah, maker is right, God, right? right? Yeah. And so where is not important. Mm -hmm. God so loved the world. Hey, Kansas City, great, but are you in the Word? Mm -hmm. Are you worshiping Him? What is it in your life that you love more than Jesus? And I had to come to that realization in 1983, right. even being a saved person that was witnessing to everybody. I love baseball more than Jesus. Mm. So I had to walk away. Yeah. It was an idol in my life. So you're you're in Zambia, and God's giving you an open door. What did the fruit look like when it started coming in? What did that look like? <laughs> the fruit was crazy. People started getting saved right and left. I mean, there was nobody hardly had a Bible. So as you're sharing the gospel with people— um, for the first year I was on the field, I uh, started 19 churches. There was six that were already there. And so we started uh, uh, 13, but the six didn't have really pastors. So we came in and uh, anyway, we, I said, I can't pastor 19 churches. Mm. So God, what do I do? Well, train some faithful men. So what I did was I brought two or three men from each location into my house one week a month. 
mm-hmm. and taught them 40 hours and then sent them back to their place to teach what I taught them. Then right. I would go back the following week and teach the church what their pastor had taught them because they'd never heard such thing. Mm. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every thought is established. So then uh, we had some other men come over. We've had missionaries come over to work with us, help us. You had the Jalowicz, I think, on last week or yeah. something like that. They had come over for a while. God sent them to Chapada, and they're still there. And Kevin Petsky came over. Uh you know, John Sarah, Brian Calloway, all these yeah. men have come over over the years, and uh, God has just um, raised up an army. So we've seen over 300 churches planted. Uh, we've seen over a little over half a million people make professions of faith. Wow. We have five training places right now that are run by the nationals where they're training church planters through our curriculum, through men that I've trained mm-hmm. personally. Mm-hmm. And then uh, God has enlarged our vision, given us a new vision. For reaching all of Sub-Saharan Africa. What were some of the difficulties that you ran into? Uh, the difficulty besides the language was uh, the disease. I've had malaria 19 times. I've had mm-hmm. uh, cerebral malaria twice, which is 95% fatal. Um, I've had uh, blackwater fever, which is a form of malaria, but instead of going to the liver, it goes to the kidney. And when you reach the black water, it's, uh, they told my wife, now I was out of it. They, mm-hmm. We were in South Africa when I came down to it. We came down with it. And my temperature was 107, and I was out of it. And, but black water fever, like I said, it, it, your urine becomes the color of this coffee. It's black. Mm-hmm. And it's like honey. It's very thick. And the pain in your stomach is unbelievable. And then the fever and everything. So black water fever, when you reach the black water, when you're urinating the black stuff, that it's 100% fatal. That's what the doctor told my wife. Oh my That's goodness. the place I was in when I was in the hospital at Joburg, South Africa. And so the doctor told my wife, again, I'm oblivious. She told me what happened, that we're either going to cure him or kill him. So they put four IVs in my arm, two quinine drips and two antibiotic drips for five days. And after five days, I opened my eyes. And I remember getting up and looking at the mirror, and I was the color of a sun-kissed orange, my whole body, because the quinine had killed everything in my body. And so the doctors looked at me, and they go, well, blackwater fever is now 99% fatal. So I was was the first one they had that (laughs) had ever survived it. So um, after that, um, actually, God was using that in my life to, to because I didn't feel like I could leave Zambia. I felt like these men still needed me. Mm-hmm. And God was, the Spirit of God was actually telling me, it's time for you to equip them. You've equipped them, now turn them loose. Now turn them loose. And I, I still wanted to sure be yeah. the man, be the missionary. So well, you, you had tied your heart to it so oh. closely yes. that it was almost probably as difficult, if not way more difficult than leaving baseball. It was so hard. It was so hard to leave that. I can remember in the hospital just weeping and crying when the doctor said I couldn't go back anymore and that if I got malaria one more time, I'd probably die and, and all this stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and so I've been able to go, of course, back and forth for a lot of years now, and God's been faithful and good. But the key to that whole thing is finally turning it over to the nationals, and yeah. they're doing a great job. Yeah, that's wonderful. We're going to pause right here for just a second so we can hear from one of our students from the Living Faith Bible Institute. Hi, my name is Chris Allred. Uh, My wife, Lindsay, and I are at Oakland Heights Baptist Church in Cartersville, Georgia, where we've been for about six years. We've served in a lot of different ministries, uh, but our main function has been to lead the middle school ministry for the past five years, up until this past August, where we've transitioned into leading our high school student ministry. Uh, We've been taking LFBI classes for a few years now, and and they've been a a really big blessing in our life. They've been instrumental in our training and our growth process. Proverbs 11 says that there's safety in the multitude of counselors. That's exactly what LFBI has been for us, a multitude of counselors. Uh, Not only do we do we get some biblical knowledge and some doctrinal training, but we have pastors and missionaries teaching these classes uh, that have a lot of experience in ministry and are able to to not just teach us from a book, but actually uh, pour some wisdom into our lives from their experience and and help to, to prepare us and train us for leadership and make us into more godly leaders and ministers. And, and LFBI has been a huge blessing, and I believe it's done just that in my life uh, thus far. I've, I've got godly men helping me to become a godly man. And I'm very grateful for LFBI. It's been a huge blessing. Visit LFBI.org to learn more about Living Faith Bible Institute. Rub some dirt on it. 
was what you were told as a kid. Yes. And it had a had a very physical, hey, be tough, be, f- be gritty, fight your way through it. And you can do anything if you're just willing to apply yourself. And so it was this very man-made concept that that transferred and became spiritual because um, you know, Paul was a man yeah. that was willing to say, hey, you know what? In Christ, I can endure anything. I can endure, endure any afflictions. I, I count it all joy Amen. when I fall into diverse temptations. There's a spiritual form of rub some dirt on it, if, if, if you will. Explain to us um, how that, that transformation took, took root in your life, the spiritual version of that. What does that mean to you today when you reflect back on all the ministry you've done and, and you're doing? What does rub some dirt on it mean to you now versus what it meant to you as a kid? One of the hardest lessons, especially young Christians, need to learn is when the brethren hurt you. Mm. I know the world hates me. I know the devil hates me. And I know I'm at war with his flesh Mm -hmm. until I finally get that final sanctification. I know I'm at war always to walk in, you know, this way or to walk according to the Spirit of God. So I've learned that. But the toughest lesson you'll learn is when the brethren stab you. Mm. when the so-called professing Christian will do everything they can to destroy you. And so the thing that I'm reminded of, of what Paul said, and you mentioned a little bit of it, he said, he said, the more I'm spent, the less I'm loved. Mm -hmm. And you're a very vulnerable situation when you're on the foreign mission field. You're completely exposed and you, all the resources that you would have in the States or in a local church setting, it's completely different dynamic. And so, you have to learn that even if men betray you, Christ never will. Never will. And he's, a, he's your defender to the end. And he, he hides you in the shadow of his wing. And, and that's, a, that's really important for us to remember because I think so many people in their imagination, there's certain things that they just won't do. And, they, and, and there's areas of their life that are kind of shut off. And maybe, maybe those who are being called to the foreign field have real fears, legitimate in their mind, legitimate fears uh, that that they might go through things that they can't handle, but that's just not how our God operates. Well, I, you know, I took over a wife and four daughters, and uh, 14, 12, 6, and four mm-hmm. to the bush. Uh, I'm going out, traveling out in a tent, village to village, leaving them there, you know, and um, it it. <sighs> Someone asked me a question before I went to Africa. Are you willing to bury your children on the mission field? Are you willing to bury your wife on the mission field? Are you willing? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, 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 don't, I didn't want to do that, but I had to say yes, because why? Jesus is worth it all. Yeah. He gave me a wife who brought me to Jesus. It's all her fault. <laughs> you know, I was able to raise my daughters there. They loved it there. You know, they sort of the oldest one sort of rebelled, but she's come back to the mm-hmm. fold. So praise mm-hmm. the Lord for that. But uh, God's been very faithful. You know, each of my daughters had malaria several times. My wife's had it several times. So, you know, bathing them in ice, trying to get their temperature down, being, uh, you know, where there is no medical doctor. But it's amazing how every time we had a major, major issue, there happened to be a doctor visiting us that knew exactly what he was doing, was able to take care of us at that particular time. Yeah. God's good. God's good. Bobby, you are a, a master storyteller. We could probably do this for another four hours, I can imagine. Um, I'll have to have you back on the show Beautiful. at some point. Sounds good. But I do want to, before you go, I want to say thank you, first of all, for just sharing your heart and, and preaching to us today. I mean, we got we got a sermon along with a testimony, so that was really good. Uh, especially the, the the stuff from Hebrews is a, is a is a beautiful reminder of what it looks like to follow Jesus. But I do want to take an opportunity to promote the books that you've written about being a missionary and about God's call in your life. The one that we talked about already is Rub Some Dirt On It. This just came out uh, over the winter. And uh, this is available on a- Amazon, and it tells the story uh, that we touched on today, just about um, following Jesus and, and, and what it looks like to trust Him uh, through hard things. And so rub some dirt on it. That just came out. But also uh, From the Diamond to the Bush is a more full and robust uh, story and biography of of uh, Bobby's life and, and what God's done in him. And, and it's got all these wonderful pictures and uh, 
nuances to the story that, that aren't in the other book. And so um, if you were to tell us a little bit about this, what would you say? This book was um, came about because of my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 12 years ago, I had a massive heart attack. I had two blood clots go in my heart and explode, destroyed about 70% of my heart. Mm-hmm. I had to have my miter valve replaced. And so I'm on my back basically for 14 months. Mm-hmm. I can't do anything. And so my wife has been begging me to put something down for our grandkids, for, you know, our yeah. kids live through it, but our grandkids don't, you know, they don't yeah. know my life. Right. So I have, uh, you know, 14 grandkids and two great grandkids. And so um, probably more coming, you know. And <laughs> so uh, I, I sat there and just did this, you know, yeah. and typed it up and uh, and kind of put something down and. And uh, there's even, you know, raising four girls. I had one little chapter. I had to put that in there. 25 things I've learned of raising daughters. Mm-hmm. So, uh, hey, man. So it's a wisdom from a, from a missionary. Wisdom from yeah, a missionary. Yeah, that's good. Well, Bobby, we're so thankful for you, and we appreciate you. Thank hey, you for coming you. on God the show. Bless love you, man. too. And we want to thank you, the listener, as well, for joining us. We pray that, that this time that we spent together with Bobby uh, was inspiring to you, that the stories that you were hearing are both humorous and fun and uh, encouraging and motivating. But we, we hope, really, at the end of the day, that they would draw you closer to Christ, that you would hear these things and you'd say, there is something to walking with Jesus and worshiping Christ and, and working for Christ, and that there is, there is something to this faith that goes beyond just sitting in a pew on Sunday mornings, uh, that it's more than just religion, but there is a relationship involved in following Jesus Christ with your whole life. And so we're asking that you would count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus today. And if, if you know that you need training uh, for this very kind of work, the foreign mission field, if you if you sense a call on your life to be a part of this kind of work somewhere in the world, giving your whole life to the cause, uh, we would recommend that you visit lfbi.org and you check out our program of study. Uh, we have a, a missions track to help equip missionaries for the field. And, and so if this is on your heart, we want to be there for you. Uh, and $40 a credit hour, it's a very easy thing to justify, but we want to be there for you and help you alongside your local church to get you the training you need to answer the call on your life. We love you, and we're so grateful for the opportunity uh, to be with you and to share Bobby with you today. And we can't wait to spend more time with you again next week for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, Please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.